Uh, I'd like to start off with, with Ellie. Uh, there's so much exciting, uh, exciting stuff happening at, at Simon & Schuster. Um, would you like to talk a little bit about uh, some of the interesting things happening in targeted verticals? Uh, sure. Um, so I think uh, the targeted verticals conversation, at least for Simon & Schuster, um, falls into a broader direct-to-consumer um, conversation where um, previously I think publishers really um, traditionally went through our valued retail partners and we didn't really know that much about who is reading our books and how much they're reading and why they're reading and what they would like to read differently. Um, so uh, starting five years ago, which is a very, the longest I've ever held a job in any capacity in any industry, <laughs> and CDO was a ridiculous title that someone said, well, if they're not going to make you president, just be a CDO. And I thought, I can't do that. And then here we are at a conference that everybody is one. Um, so direct to consumer, we have just uh, passed about a million um, subscribers that we have collected data on that's um, pretty rich in terms of the kinds of preferences we have on them, both through their pathing through our sites um, in, that would indicate uh, interest, their um, preferences that they uh, give to us about their profile, their purchase behavior, um, their uh, authors that they want to fan or follow. So basically putting together a brew, if you will, of a d bunch of different data points on our um, customer base, and we really plan on ramping that up significantly. We needed to get a lot of the sort of building blocks in place because previously direct-to-consumer wasn't really a focus for really many um, publishers. So off of that, you can imagine once you have your list and you know what they want and how they want it in terms of format, in terms of genre, in terms of demographics, psychographics, and whatnot, um, you can begin to create um, direct-to-consumer verticals and niches such as we have a number of lifestyle blogs out there that talk about parenting, that talk about clutter busting, that talk about nail polish being you know, carcinogenic, whatnot, and they are very lightly branded Simon & Schuster because, again, the content is the star. These are really what you would traditionally call excerpts from books. So at some point, you know, our, our group, the digital group, thinks that we are working, working in a content company that has fantastic books, but that books can be presented in many different ways, not just first cover, 500 pages, back matter, back cover. It could be an excerpt. It could be a photo. It could be a sidebar. It could be a list. It could be very short form. It could be prequel. It could be postquill. It doesn't all have to be sort of the traditional three-year or whatever, however long it takes to write, produce, market and then push to backlist your books. Um, so we've picked certain um, content verticals and I think another interesting thing, not just for Simon & Schuster, but starting to see across the industry is, uh, it's much like I used to run MTV.com and I think there are a lot of sort of music veteran survivors here. Um, <laughs> and whereas many of the um, labels weren't a destination, but early days tried to create a destination for themselves, but people are fans of Bono. They don't know if they're Maverick or Capital or whatever. It's similar in the book industry. People are fans of Jodi Picot. They may not know that she's Atria, and nor should they, that she is the brand, she is the star. So um, we are only a set percentage, if you will, of the market share. So when we create these verticals, we have a very sort of um, open editorial policy towards uh, tipping to other books, and they don't even just have to be books. They could be other bloggers, other op-ed pieces, other long-form pieces that are about that subject matter. So effectively, where you're curating the topic of jogging or curating the topic of organizing your home or whatnot. So we've done that. Um, for um, a number of verticals and plan to continue to do so. And obviously it en enriches our database, but it also gives us the ability to um, have a conversation, if you will, about books, but not do it by saying, buy my book, buy my book, buy my book, but really engaging people around the topics that these books are about, gaining that trust, gaining that engagement, and then putting in front of them our books, which really are pertinent and which really are wonderful, but it's a very different, um, engaged, content-driven conversation as opposed to uh, a sales promotion. And on building that database, everyone in the room wants to know, how do we build our database and how do we get more information from it? And of course, now with all these insights and analytics, any additional field you request the customer or client fill out means you're probably going to get fewer and fewer subscriptions. So the more data, the more data is better for you, but it actually works against you by asking for more information. How it do does. you balance that? I mean, early days we, we started creating, um, tagging our books. So in the publishing industry, they're BISAC codes, which is basically the way that rack jobbers or retailers stock their shelves into sections and they're not uniform. So it might be thriller in one bookstore and mystery in another or something like that, or horror. Um, we wanted to create them more so that they had consumer 
um, meaning. So it could be chiclet, or it could be beach reads, or it could be Judaica, or gift books, or things that don't necessarily correspond to the way the trade tags, if you will, um, content. And so we sort of had to set up shop, if you will, so that we were even consumer-centric and not mm. just trade-centric. You don't want to be either or, you want to be both. Um, we need to even trade, uh, change our copy, not to be flap copy that sells into librarians and into a bookstore, but something that someone's going to pick up and read and say, oh, I get the gist, I get the gist of this book. Um, but then there's the whole you know, uh, email um, database platform and how you uh, set that up, but I think importantly how you merge it, because you can create uh, rich and deep um, data, but having the ability to combine it and have those pieces support each other and then send out sort of welcomed emails is I think a lot of the trick and a lot of the investment. And you're right, the early days when we asked people to opt in, I think we had like 30 different preferences <laughs> and we found out that fewer than 10% indicated more than one or two of those preferences. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to go at it differently. Social media certainly helps mm -hmm. um, in terms of seeing what people are talking about, what they're, um, what they're browsing, you can take that as a indication but for us, the strongest indication is when someone fans or follows an author, now you know the, the richest piece of information right. about them. You're not guessing about a genre. You know exactly that they love Stephen King or they love you know, uh, Annie Pruel or whoever it may be. So um, I think the other piece is the reward. What are, what are you giving them in return for them um, divulging their, um, their information? So for example, in eBooks now, we put in the front matter of the book and the back matter of a book built into the files that we distribute to every e-tailer, an opportunity for readers to say, you know, you're either about to start this book or you just finished, most of it's in the back. It's after they finish the book, they love it. There's a sign-up opportunity to give us their email and in return we'll give you more information about this author, this genre. We're working on that copy and testing it and trying to really give them something of true value, whether it be a sneak peek on the next book by that author or something more than sort of an umbrella promise that's you know, more wonderful things from Simon & Schuster. It really needs to be more matched up, whether it be matching their preferences or connecting them with others who have like kind interests. Mm -hmm. So building community in, in the back of the books and saying we will connect you. Some people are private readers. They don't want to talk about what they love with strangers. They, they still want to refer to friends and, and I read a statistic recently saying that um, people who, who do um, recommendations through friends, which is peer-to-peer -peer is growing, I think it was something like 90% of that still happens physically. You're in a room talking to somebody. You're not necessarily um, liking a book and taking that as your strong mm -hmm. uh, indicator that um, even if you know that person and you trust them and you think you're similar to them. Mm -hmm. So we need to figure out a way to kind of replicate that conversation. And briefly, because I want to bring Fred in after this, <coughs> I've heard your numbers in video are just going through the roof. Tell us a little bit about, you know, print publisher heading to video because it touches on, I think, the rest of the panel too. And maybe we'll bring Fred in as his experience at Vivo now Condé Nast. Sure. Well, um, we built, uh, when I got there in 2008, we built a digital studio in our building and the thinking was, again, the authors are our stars, they're in the building, you know, often talking to their editors, finance, publishers, cover copy, why wouldn't they swing by a digital studio? Video is so viral and of course we want to know um, why did you write this book, who are your literary influences, but we also want to know um, if you hadn't been a writer, what would have you been? David McCullough would have been a piano player. Most people turn out want to play electric guitar, but uh, I think that's just true for the general population. Um, so I wanted to take more of a Facebook 360 approach to First and foremost, you want to know about what they've written, why they've written it, and what else they read or think about literature or their topic. But after that, I think you want to be a general fan. And so we have videos that are more traditional, and then we have ones that are I'll call more 360s that are what we call author revealed. And those are sort of um, Proustian questionnaires, if you will, about that author. And we syndicate it. We have our own channel. We have our own video. But it's all embeddable and it's all travels with metadata and it's all sortable, if you will. So we um, have 20, over 20 million views to date on about 3,500 videos that are short form, two to three minute pieces with our authors and we have relationships. We just launched three channels on Roku. We have a YouTube channel, of course, or several YouTube channels. We have, um, <clears throat> you know, sort of a lot of the 5min.com, DBG, Blinks, so for a book publisher to have a channel on Roku wasn't necessarily the obvious move, but these are um, entertaining pieces that are not ad supported. Right. And I think people who are real fans of topics or authors, when they put the book down, they want to know more. 
and Fred. So Fred, you know, what an incredible career from music at Universal Music Group, Vivo, you know, starting that up and running that, and now Condé Nast. Uh, is video a big part of Condé Nast's future? And how, how are you working? Oh, I should say, Ellie, who do you report to? Oh, I report to our CEO, Carolyn Reedy. There you go. Fred, who do you report to? I report to the president of the entertainment group, Don Ostroff. Fantastic. So, um, so my the whole reason I'm at Condé Nast is for video. Um, for those of you that don't know, um, the entertainment division at Condé Nast was founded about a year ago. Um, it's run by Dawn Ostroff, who's the former president of the CW Network. Um, and her role as president of the division is to really create feature film, television, and digital video extensions for all of the Condé Nast brands. My role as chief digital officer is obviously lead, to lead the digital side of the business and come up with a comprehensive content creation, distribution, audience development, and monetization strategy for all the brands. Um, and I think it's a, a tremendous opportunity. Um, a lot of people ask me why I left Vivo. Um, we were doing you know, upwards of 100 million plays a day, 4 billion plays a month. You think you've reached the peak. Um, you've got it done. <laughs> and now you're walking into a magazine publisher that's doing you know, a handful of you know, hundreds of thousands of plays per month. Um, but I think what excited me about Conley Nast was the puzzle pieces are all there. And it really just someone needed to come in and, and try to start fitting them all together. Um, and the biggest puzzle piece of all are the brands. Um, Conley Nast is one of the few companies that represents over 20 iconic household names in media. Vogue, GQ, Vanity Fair, Wired, The New Yorker, Bon Appetit. I mean, the list just goes on and on. Um, and to me, um, that that was the basis of a network, not, not unlike what we did at Vivo, where we said um, it wasn't just about, and, and Ellie touched on this, not just about the labels that they belong to, Universal or Sony, but how do we start aggregating scale and building an audience business when we partner Justin Bieber with Lady Gaga, with Rihanna, with Katy Perry, that starts to become a meaningful play. And I think we have something similar that we can do um, in our space um, to create audience. Um, the other piece of the puzzle, the other puzzle piece I saw immediately um, right there was the incredible relationships with advertisers. Um, you know, if you look at any of our traditional magazines, um, you know, the advertisements and the relationships there are almost, they're, they're a form of content in our medium and our relationships are very, very, uh, very deep. So if we could figure out a way to bring all these brands together on a platform and figure out a way to bring the advertisers in into this new business and then add what I'll say is kind of the, th the third puzzle piece for me, which was, which was something that probably wasn't there internally but something that we've been building. Um, how, do we, how do we make digital video a skill set that becomes endemic to Condé Nast? So this is not something that you can have the magazines do on a part-time basis. They've got um, a tremendous set of responsibilities They've got their own deadlines. Um, to ask them to pile this on top, I don't think would be sustainable. So how do we bring in um, the engineers who know how to do this? How do we bring in the operational people who know how to do this, who do the non-sexy stuff, like make sure videos are titled correctly, make sure the right metadata is there? How do we build a CMS that allows the brands um, you know, to really easily interact with their content and, and distribute it more efficiently? Um, this is something that I don't think was in place and something we've been focused on building and it's going to help us scale our business and distribute faster. Um, so for me, um, you know, the opportunity is to get um, consistent programming out from each of the brands in digital video. Um, it's not B-roll, right? It's not, you know, let's shoot, you know, whoever's on the cover this month, get some video on it and put it on the website, but let's tell stories that are in the voice of our brands, that are inspired by our brands. Let's distribute that content as broadly as we can. Um, let's you know, make sure we're marketing it and let's put a monetization strategy against it that allows us to leverage our, our relationships with advertisers and build a new scalable audience development business for the company. When people ask me, can a magazine publisher be successful in this space? I say the answer is yes. Um, you know, Conley Nass is a 100 year old plus company. Um, the heritage is obviously in the magazines, but whenever they've decided to invest, whether it's been their websites or the digital editions and the apps or our social media presence, we've reached scale um, in the form of tens of millions of people. With the right investment in video, um, which is what we have now, um, I think it's um, a, one more platform that we're now gonna we're now gonna reach scale in as a company. I want to bring uh, bring Michael in, but a quick question for both Ellie and Fred. 
you know, monetization of video is a big challenge, right? I mean, uh, how is that growing, or do you have revenue targets? Uh, can you give us a little bit of background, either one? Anyone want to jump in on that? I mean, my, my goal is not, I, I'm not ad supported. So my goal is, is more of an awareness goal. And um, sometimes when we do syndication deals, we will have a rev split on, on revenue, but that is not my goal. My goal is with a shrinking brick and mortar universe, and I think very limited browsing options in e-tail, per, excellent purchase, but minimal browsing and discovery, I'm much more focused on driving awareness with a big buy button on it mm -hmm. as opposed to right. um, uh, ad revenue. If anything, I'd rather put a, bad, a buy button in an overlay in a video using some new technology platforms and let them buy the book right. than try and monetize it with ads for my balls. Interesting. How about you, Fred? So more ad, ad yeah, support? Yeah, we're, we're ad support. I mean, we're not doing literal translations of the magazines and video. It's, it's a completely separate business line for us. Um, and in my opinion, the proliferation of technology and new platforms have, has made the demand for premium content from, from quality brands um, higher than it's ever been. Well, let's, let's, uh, let's bring Michael in because, uh, Michael, you know, you're writing a book now. Match Point should be out soon. This is a fascinating look at the real-time buy side and uh, ad, uh, online ads. Uh, you're the expert. How, how are you, what are you seeing in the marketplace? Can you give us a little bit of background on the book? The background on the book is that I, I've been working for three years to uh, write a book about digital advertising, the history of digital advertising, with a, with a focus on uh, profiling several of the uh, innovators, the pioneers that were, in, in my view, the inventors of these systems. So that's what the book's about. <laughs> Thank you. And. Uh, <laughs> When, when can we expect that? And will it be, uh, is it Simon & Schuster publishing it? <laughs> uh, I, I, when, is it when is it out? It'll be out in the fall. I haven't uh, done a publisher deal yet. Fantastic. Great. Look but forward to reading that. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, uh, I would like to bring in Joe. I'm kind of excited to have Joe on the panel because um, you came from ISIS and uh, you're, you're at AMI. And one of the thing, a couple of things I like is, you know, they, you got a budget, you know, with $30 million, you got headcount, you're reporting to the CEO, you're reporting to the board. Not only that, but I've noticed over the last couple of months that you're showing some significant progress. You've brought in a senior management team. Tell us a little bit about what's happening at AMI. Sure, yeah. So I joined uh, American Media, as you mentioned, in August behind a $30 million investment by the board uh, that was really led by our CEO, David Becker, who was just uh, committed to this being the right time for American media to make the investment uh, in digital. And I think every organization kind of reaches that point where they have to, they have to change and, and kind of try the new thing or push in a new direction, and this is the right time for American media. And so I'm a, you know, prior to this role at American media, I'm a, I'm a product guy. So I spent the past 20 years uh, designing and building products uh, in the startup space, uh, in the web space, you know, evenly split between web and mobile. Uh, at companies, that, as you mentioned, like Columbia House and Fox and, uh, and some startups as well. And so for me, you know, when I come into an opportunity like American Media, uh, it's, you know, it's, you know, day one, bring in my team, day two, what's the problem, day three, start fixing the problem. And so we've been very aggressive about uh, hitting the ground running with putting the right, uh, right people, processes, infrastructure, uh, products in place, and, uh, and it's starting to, you know, bear fruit quickly. It, you know, uh, we've had our highest traffic months for seven of our ten titles in January. Uh, can you, can you name some of those? I mean, the big competition is TMZ, and right, you're facing yeah. all kinds of uh, competition from online as well as... Highly competitive space, yeah. Right. So we're, we're in the, uh, in the, in the uh, fitness and wellness space. We have Shape, we have Men's Fitness, uh, we have Muscle and Fitness, and a bunch of enthusiast titles. Uh, in the entertainment space, we have Radar Online, we have OK Magazine and OK Online. Uh, and then some, uh, some uh, smaller players in the space. And so very competitive space and a very commoditized space in terms of how, uh, the, the, con how the content is perceived in the market. So mm -hmm. spent a lot of time really fixing, uh, you know, first and foremost, the platforms. Uh, so how, you know, how the content is organized, uh, tagged, uh, created, and presented to consumers. So really the, the bottom of the stack in terms of our, uh, how our data is organized and the top of the stack in terms of how we're presenting it to consumers. Uh, and then, you know, really focused on how do, we, how do we make sure that these brands are connecting with consumers in an engaging enough way to attract newer advertisers right. and, uh, you know, and really get that uh, up and running. And then a lot of investment in video, uh, 
We're doing a lot of original video now at AMI, uh, investment in social, and kind of a lot of the, you know, the blocking and tackling of building a digital business. All right. And you brought in, you know, you've got a team now. Uh, it took you, yeah. what, just a few months, and you really revamped the whole team, got rid of a couple, a couple of sort of yeah. print side, I think 16 layoffs or something, but really yeah. focus is moving to, to, to try to ramp up the digital revenues, right? Every, yeah, so everywhere I go, I have, you know, I have, uh, you know, going back 20 years, I have people that uh, like to come along for the ride. It's always a fun, <laughs> exciting experience. <laughs> Uh, especially, you know, I like to pick companies like AMI where uh, they're, they're at that inflection point and ready for change. Right. And so it's, it's always a dynamic environment. Uh, and so, you know, uh, we kind of uh, dust off the dust from the last opportunity and go to the next one and, and start again, uh, and the, the team comes with me. Great. And uh, David, David Kang, you know, uh, incredible career, Bertelsmann, you've been through number and now at Wenner, uh, exciting times there. You've done some in, in interesting deals with, I believe, Yahoo. Can you give us a little bit of background on, on what's happening there and some inside story? Yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, our three titles at Wenner are Rolling Stone, Us Weekly, and Men's Journal. And um, one of the things we quickly understood, or I understood in coming on board, is that we had really great boutique brands. Um, the editorial is fantastic. Um, the uh, brand recognition, the imaging, um, all terrific. But one of the things we realized in order for us to really grow is that we needed a scale partner in order uh, for us to really be able to get, you know, we think the, the eyeballs on our, our on our content. I guess the overall view is we're taking a brand-centric approach, and so not thinking of ourselves as a magazine company per se that's doing some digital stuff, but that we have really great brands and that we want to extend on platforms. So as part of those conversations, um, you know, in the traffic that all of us do, you know, day to day, there's a lot of content syndication that happens. And we had been working um, with Yahoo as a very close partner, and uh, we had seen that they had taken a strategic shift away from uh, the content for syndication uh, for traffic kind of bartering deals, which are so typical um, in digital. And so we approached them and either, you know, we needed to find a new partner or perhaps we could do something more strategic and significant. And this was uh, early last year uh, during uh, Ross Levinson's tenure as okay. uh, interim CEO. And uh, so it, we ended up happily, you know, getting to a concept where essentially we would um, have a, a, a boutique, if you will, that lived within Yahoo's ecosystem. We would have integrations with them on our sites uh, as well as in our print magazines uh, because they're expanding in their footprint, Yahoo had been already doing deals with GMA and some others. And uh, so we were very much on track. And then, as we all know, um, there was uh, they went in a different direction. And so, uh, you know, the very talented Marissa Meyer came on board. And uh, so, you know, we were very concerned whether it would, you know, is she going to do media deals? Is she only, only going to do product, et cetera? And one of the things that we were so excited about is, again, the strength of our brands. And I think that, you know, Marissa Meyer herself is, I think, a big Us Weekly fan. Um, we <laughs> managed true. to, you know, get our deal uh, done. And so, you know, the benefits have been terrific already. So first of all, from a traffic perspective, it's really greatly lifted and enhanced what we've done um, with both Us Weekly and uh, with Rolling Stone. And beyond that, the exciting things are uh, to come uh, this year in that uh, we are partnering um, to create products together that we are already taking out to the marketplace, the advertisers, where we are bringing the, again, boutique quality of, uh, say, a Rolling Stone, for example, but then we're able to scale it on a platform as enormous as Yahoo. And so, for example, you know, artists still love the idea of being on the cover of Rolling Stone, and they would love to be on our website, et cetera, but when they're releasing their record, they're thinking, well, you know, but it's still, you know, a great title, but it's a magazine, and the website isn't anywhere near as big as all of the other places, et cetera. So now what we're able to do is to approach them and say, again, boutique quality, it's Rolling Stone editors, et cetera, but we're able to scale this as, as big as it can possibly be. Um, and similarly for Us Weekly, you know, getting um, Us Weekly editors and curators um, to cover things like the Oscars, where we had our second highest traffic day ever um, over, over the Oscars, um, second only to us breaking the um, Kristen Stewart uh, cheating affair last summer. Um, it's titillating, painful. yes. It, it was us uh, that, that, that broke that story. Um, we, we think we're really combining the best of, of both worlds, and I think it's a different way of thinking about us rather than just a magazine company, as again, we have great brands, we have great editors, but we really, you know, digital is all about scale, and right. so we're very excited about the partnership. Well, I'd like to talk a little bit about mobile, and I want to bring Michael in at, at some point to discuss, you know, sort of the challenges with mobile advertising, and but, you know, when or 
famously said, of course, you know, a contrarian that uh, iPad was, you know, less of an emphasis on the iPad. Uh, now things have changed, apparently. Right? So is there a direct are you heading in a mobile yeah. or a tablet yeah. direction? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, all of our, you know, titles are, have been available, you know, in PDF replica um, on Zinio, Nook, um, et cetera. Uh, as replicas for quite some time, but um, the investment required to uh, go for an interactive edition on an iPad, I mean, it is an investment. And one of the things, to speak plainly about it, is I think the reason why, you know, Rolling Stone and Winner has been around now 46 years and counting, is that the company has been very clear-eyed about investments that it makes. And, you know, all of us on the panel here are veterans of the first bubble, et cetera. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes you get ahead of yourself a little bit in terms of the economics. And so what I think the company's strategy has been is to really understand that the market is there and ready for it, and that, in fact, it does, you know, turn into a profit center when we launch it. And so there's that kind of mentality with it, you know, has benefits with it as well. We got tremendous promotion um, when we launched, you know, our US uh, Interactive Edition um, from Apple uh, over a year ago, um, and then recently, a couple months ago, Rolling Stone uh, mm -hmm. in the Interactive Edition, you can play the songs, etc. went up, and again, Apple, will, you know, because we were one of the later ones to go up, you know, we got a tremendous amount of promotion from them. Fantastic. So sometimes being, you know, first isn't necessarily from a business lens um, the best way to go. Right. We're going to take questions in a minute. We do have some from Twitter already, so be prepared. Um, but Michael, I want to jump in because online advertising challenging enough, mobile advertising even more challenging to monetize. Can you give us a little background on uh, sort of the challenges there? I'm going to recharacterize it because I think online sure. advertising is awesome. <laughs> it has its challenges, right? But it's awesome. Now, in in uh, with regard to mobile, and and more specifically smartphones, because uh, a, a lot of folks consider tablets mobile, and it's different, you know, seven or ten inch screen size. So just putting that aside for a moment, uh, m smartphones are uh, are fast. Uh, becoming the, the, they're not yet the dominant device uh, used to view a site like Forbes, but they're going to be there very shortly. Uh, so the, the challenge, as you characterized it, is that on a, on a web page, you, you've got enough space to have uh, display ads that, that, are, that are large, uh, that command a high CPM, and you can put a lot of them on the page. You can put four, you can put six, you can actually comfortably put right. that many. You can't do that on a smartphone screen. Uh, going north of one is <laughs> hard. Right. And the uh, CPM on the, uh, on, the, on the desktop site uh, for each of the many ads may be anywhere from you know, above the fold US traffic, $30. Uh, below the fold international traffic, $2. But uh, that, that one small banner, the sticky ad, as a lot of folks call it, because it kind of scrolls with you, it's in the two, three dollar CPM range. So they're, they're, because people are spending so much time on these devices consuming our content, that there, there will be, I have no doubt, a correction in terms of the economics. I don't believe this will persist, because at the end of the day, the advertisers uh, bidding for the consumer's time, but at the moment it's it's uh, it's it's way out of proportion. By sure. So we, tr we traded digital uh, digital what was it print dollars for digital dimes and now mobile pennies or what are we talking? Is that a good summary? I mean, at the moment, I would agree with uh, with web currency to to mobile less. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, Forbes certainly didn't trade uh, print dollars for digital <laughs> dimes. They didn't. Uh, but I, I'm familiar with the phrase, uh, and, and I, I get it. At the moment, at this moment, mobile's harder to monetize than a web page, and it largely has to do with the size of the screen. Yeah. But that's going to change. Okay. Uh, Good. Uh, yeah, I, was, I assume all of you have direct sales forces right now out selling ads for you? Is that, is that correct? Not Ellie, but everybody else? Um, 
there's been a trend recently in programmatic trading where automation is replacing direct sales forces, but at lower CPMs. How do you see that panning out over the next several years? Yeah. Um, I think that it is going to be a part of the mix of what we offer clients. Um, you know, as it turns out, I was on an on a ad sales call uh, earlier this week, and um, literally the client was looking to develop a you know, branded entertainment campaign um, for Rolling Stone around live music, you know, fantastic high touch kind of event. And, you know, when uh, we knew that they were a digitally sophisticated client, um, they brought their chief digital officer out, they flew our chief digital <laughs> officer out, and um, literally this exact thing came out. Because what advertisers are trying to do, to lay a little bit of the background, is that getting, you know, premium uh, branded entertainment content is high CPM and they're willing to make that investment. In the middle is having adjacencies to content and they're a lot less interested in that because, well, so what? Because it could be next to that, they're buying audiences rather than the fact that it just happens to be next to a Rolling Stone article. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing that still significant but decrease. The part that you're talking about where it's more targeted or programmatic, and so I think the best example is we've all had the experience of when you go to a website, um, you put something in your shopping cart and then that thing somehow travels and follows you around to every subsequent website you visit, um, is the exact kind of thing that clients are looking to do because they've made an investment in this, in this content, you visited it, but as you travel around the web, they want to be able to more efficiently buy that inventory. And so to I think where you're going, I think that there is going to be be a very high growth area around this kind of branded content version. And I also think that this programmatic that is data driven, this is the big data thing, this is you know being much more efficient, now you know which half of your money you're wasting in your ad plan, <laughs> uh, if you will, um, I think is going to be increasing as well. And I think that as a publisher, um, we are in the process of embracing that um, as we're now getting that request from clients and trying to say, you know what, that person can see the great branded campaign we do, but then the exact item that they were looking at in your store can also appear in a programmatic ad and the two work really well together. So we think of it as premium programmatic um, and then there's the remainder stuff and that's the stuff the you know flying the plane with the empty seats and that stuff is going to be low CPM but it's also very ineffective. So thank you David. Thanks Andy. Uh, Dan Backhouse. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to uh, latch on to uh, questions there that Michael and, uh, and David were just talking about. Um, all of you guys are content publishers and you know there's a big push, uh, uh, David you had just mentioned it, branded content um, and so-called native advertising and contextual advertising that's you know, well targeted and tied in with the, uh, with the topic of the content that you're consuming. How do you um, ensure, uh, the temptation must be there to sort of you know, inject the advertising into the content you're producing, you know, not as overtly or plump as uh, an advertorial, but, but sort of skewing the content to favor whoever your advertisers are. And how do you, uh, do you see that happening and um, how do you prevent it from occurring and, you know, retain the editorial integrity, I suppose? Yeah. Uh, uh, absolutely. Um, you know, the way uh, we have a funny little analogy, uh, there's a skit on Saturday Night Live where Christopher Walken, they're playing Don't Fear the Reaper, and he's hitting the cowbell really hard, and he says, I want to hear more cowbell. Uh, that's my kind of funny analogy for when we work with clients, a lot of times, you know, they say we want more brand integration uh, to the point that it turns into a commercial. And what we've discovered is that, you know, when we're successful at it, what we do is that we are able to convince the client that, first of all, there's a bright line between, you know, editorial integrity and, uh, you know, having that brand integration and that it actually is serving them better if we're allowed to create content that is editorially driven that the, that the audience sees as organic and something that's consistent with uh, the Rolling Stone, with the Us Weekly, with the men's journal brands, rather than something that is basically a commercial in disguise because you're always one click away with that. Um, it is, you know, we have editors that are, you know, very flexible and open in how they think. We, you know, had a series of internal uh, big ideas meeting over the last few weeks as there are things that the editors are 
excited about doing, which makes a lot of difference in the final product. But then the sellers are able to go out and inevitably the clients shape them, et cetera. But it is very agency-like, um, for lack of a better phrase. And um, it's something that you know we're developing our own skills in doing. But I do think it's the trend. And you know again, the CPMs are much better. And I think it's consistent with this idea that we're a boutique and that once you invest in one of those programs, again, back to Yahoo, that's why you want that massive scale. Because if you produced a beautiful, expensive video, you know, you want as many eyeballs on it as you can get. Right. It seems like syndication is cutting across a lot of Simon & Schuster at Vivo and, and others. I mean, syndication is a big part of getting it out to where the eyeballs are instead of hoping people will be to path to your door, right? Yeah. yeah. So no Bank of America ads on Matt Tybee articles? You know, uh, uh, the short answer is no. Matt, <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't tend to do much branded content around politics. It's, uh, it's music um, where it works. Right. Great. Any other questions? Yes, Katrina Clear, who was CMO with Microsoft Channels, now at Accenture. Scott? I'm usually loud, I'm usually loud enough, but we'll use the mic anyway. Uh, so many of you alluded to uh, thinking through your CMS as part of the journeys in your various roles. I'd love to hear about what was your biggest challenge related to either setting up or evolving your CMS because we all think about the content side of stuff a lot, and you, that's kind of the sexy part to talk about at work all day with people. But if you don't have the great CMS, as we all know, behind the scenes, you're kind of toast. So what were some of the biggest challenges you faced in that? And what was the part of that that surprised you the most that you didn't think was going to either be so hard or complicated? Good question. For me, the, the question <clears throat> still is more about um, our websites, I mean, people call us about the heat in the building's not working, can you fix it? Um, I think there's still a huge divide as to what does a digital group do within a traditional media company? And I'm like, so I just call, I just get the heat fixed. But um, it's easier. But uh, a lot of it has to do with the division between IT and digital, and it's sort of like the adage about, you know, garbage in, garbage out. We, I keep saying we're a display monitor for all the metadata, assets, et cetera, that go into the systems. And there are many, many traditional sort of workflows uh, that feed it, and people still put in publicity assistant, call Carla and book today's show, you know, likes peonies. I mean, honestly, there's stuff that gets fed out to our retailers, to our live sites that are notes uh, from the day when people thought they could just sort of note something to themselves, or, gee, I don't know the pub <laughs> date for your book, so I'll just say 2030 just so it gets pushed out. <laughs> well, that goes live yeah. as, you know, no jacket <laughs> coming published in 2030. So to me, the mechanics of the technology are actually a lot simpler than the cultural shift to realizing yeah. that these things, um, metadata is consumer facing, it's mm -hmm. no longer a zero or one version of a yellow sticky note and getting people to make it easy for them so they don't have parallel sets of systems that feed the old world right. versus the new world. I think it's our jobs to make sure that we're integrating into the traditional workflows and making life as easy as possible, not duplicating tags and metadata and whatnot, but um, actually getting the stuff right because you know once it's out there, it's cached and you can pull it down, but it's kind of stuck, right? So it's not a technical answer. I still find it's a human nature <laughs> issue. Can, can I take a, yeah, just yeah, a sure. quick shot of that. Um, I'd say treat your back end systems like your front end. Yeah. Make it incredibly simple. You know, you've got a user community that needs to use this stuff efficiently. You don't want them to feel pain when they're logging in. So, you know, we, we just built a, a, a CMS in, internally. We focused on doing a couple of key functions really, really, really well. Um, nail that, make it seamless for, you know, the guys at, at the brands who are touching this every day to use it and then build off your base. But really treat it like a front-end product that you'd want to use every day. Great. Great questions. Great. Please, everybody, thank our panel. I appreciate it.